and if I can if I can take the example that you mentioned about a person moving in a in a busy city like London or New York and and, and then take even and, and take it one step further because the loneliness epidemic as you said I mean it's been here even before the pandemic now with if we couple that with the hybrid work environment where right. you wake up yeah. and you don't even walk in the office yeah. you switch on your laptop in the same yeah room yep. that you woke up in yeah this must makes it make it even more challenging and, and i have two questions for you here is how do you how do you see this new uh, reality what's uh, what's your, your impression of this new reality and and the second thing is how how can someone i mean if he, uh, what's your opinion on how can someone be proactive in actually creating uh, an environment where they can belong in and they can create social interactions, whether it's work or at least after yep. work. Yep. Um, okay. Actually, let me just back up one one step a moment uh, and go back to the previous topic um, and just highlight the fact that it's not just the twenty somethings uh, that have this loneliness effect because they're kind of in a strange environment, you know. In the modern world where people are moving from all over the world now uh, for, for their jobs, you know, those people, the migrant part of the, the um, office, as it were, who are coming in from, you know, all you know, Japan or China, or even Greece uh, to, to London, you know, suddenly you're thrown into a completely alien culture. It's not, you know, it, you know at least with the 20 year olds, they're in the same culture if they're from that country, uh, even if they don't know where the pubs are or where the kind of clubs are or what have you, at least they <laughs> know the language and they understand the culture. But if you're coming in from outside of any age, you've got a double problem. Okay, if you're coming with family, you've got kind of a base to go back to and to build up slowly, slowly friendships in the place where you live. But if you're coming in as a single uh, a man or woman, uh, into those environments in your 30s or 40s, then, you know, you are in a, just as bad a position as the 20-somethings. And so it's also trying to create the sense of, if you like, welcoming in of these people into that particular organization. Now, you can imagine this is going to create even bigger problems if half the time uh, the office is actually sitting at home, you know. Um, and I think the experience has been quite shocking in many ways in during lockdown. Uh, a number of people have commented on this, how weird it is that you can employ somebody, uh, 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 and this was actually happening, you could employ somebody, they never ever met anybody else in person from their department or, or their floor where they would normally have been expecting to sit and and casually meet people um because you know in lockdown everybody was having to work from home all they got was zoom and zoom is not a great environment none of these you know these are magical uh, the, the technology is magical you know at the end of the day it's very clever that we can you know sit here on opposite sides of the world and have a conversation with each other but it, I think everybody's experience during lockdown with Zoom was it works very nicely with family because we've known family forever, right? So everybody understands how everybody else takes and they make allowances for Uncle Jimmy, who's always rude, and <laughs> uh, Auntie so and so, who's always telling jokes and, and all these kind of things. And, and they don't mind sitting in silence for a while. Um, it works quite well for groups of friends who've known each other for a long time but only when that group is small probably about four people works fine if it's bigger than that the problem is that we are limited to the number of people that can be involved in a conversation to four people we cannot have four people in a conversation uh, in real life uh, because if what happens is if a fifth person joins it will split very very quickly into two conversations two separate conversations. So we can't do that on Zoom. It's extremely difficult. Uh, IT guys have tried to make environments where that's possible, but I still don't think it's, it's, it's very successful because 
you know, uh, well, for all sorts of reasons, which we needn't worry about here. But the problem is what then happens is the Zoom meeting gets dominated by four people with the loudest voices. These are usually the guys. So the girls don't like it. Uh, um, and everybody else goes to sleep or reads their news feeds or checks their email or looks out of the window to see the bus going past or what have you. Um, so it's never quite working in in the way it does and uh, and i don't see how it ever can because there's something about the face-to-face -face world which has a kind of magic to it and that comes out of the way we engage with each other in conversations and partly also by the fact that it was people we know and you know very well good friends and family relationships with us we spend a lot of time you know giving them hugs and patting them on the shoulder and stroking their arm and all these kind of things without really thinking about it and and that those that kind of soft touches it sometimes was really important for the creating the quality of relationships and you cannot do that on zoom you can't go and have a beer with somebody on zoom i can sit here and show you my glass but it's not the <laughs> same <laughs> we can't we, dance I want, with you on Zoom, but, you know, it's very limited. I want, I want to stand on two points that you mentioned here. One is, one is I was uh, like reading your research. Uh, I, I loved how uh, you've seen the evolution from like primates, from grooming into the soft stroking and the touch. And so I just wanted to, to emphasize the fact that from your research, it shows that this is an evolution of one of our uh, like uh, physiological uh, yeah. designs. Yes, yeah. So, so um, in in all monkeys and apes, and that's the family we belong to. Uh, social relationships are created by social grooming. So they're leafing through the fur, uh, removing bits of vegetation and uh, dead skin and all this kind of stuff. And that movement of the hand across the fur, as you do when you're stroking somebody, triggers a very specialized neural system. And that neural system responds to only one stimulus, and that is light, slow stroking at exactly three centimeters a second. If you stroke somebody faster than that, or slower than that, the it system doesn't, doesn't respond. Doesn't, pick up. doesn't respond, it's amazing. Um, and uh, but and secondly, that that system is connected directly uh, to the areas in the brain which trigger the endorphin system. So that light, slow stroking triggers this endorphin response in the brain, which really is the key pharmacological mechanism underpinning our friendships with with anybody. Um, and all the things we do in social life. Well, OK, let's put it this way. Um, this works very well for monkeys and apes. We still do it, but it's very intimate and personal. So you can only do it with one person at a time, right? If you don't believe me, I simply invite you to go and sit in the back seat of the cinema and try cuddling with two people at the same time, right? <laughs> two other people. I can guarantee one of them will leave in about five minutes and they will leave. When they leave, they'll be quite cross. Right, because you've been paying too much attention to the other person. This is a very kind of intimate and personalized thing. So it limits the size of group you can have. And so what's happened in the course of our evolution as a species is we've found other ways of triggering the endorphin system in the brain without having to involve touch. And these are the things like laughter, singing, dancing, the rituals of religion, eating and drinking together socially, uh, feasting, if you like, um, and lastly, storytelling. And all of these we've shown trigger the endorphin system. And when they trigger the endorphin system, they make us feel bonded to whoever we're doing it with. It doesn't change our relationships to people who are not there on that occasion, but to the people we're doing it with, even if they're complete strangers, it creates this sense of warmth and uh, trust and coziness that creates the basis for, for friendships. And then we can kind of go into seven pillars mode and, and sort of figure out the, the details of- uh, The of commons, it. yeah, the common but, aspects. But yeah, so, so it's- But going back to your experience, your, your, your um, example of the, of the worker uh, moved into the new city and your point, 
uh, about the fact that video, because uh, your comment, which I, I loved, was that the fact that if we're talking with a loved one on video or an old friend or a relative, the relationship is there. So this yeah. is a great means of communication. Yeah. <clears throat> My question is, if we go back to the person who got a, a job in a big city that are engaging with a company in, in a video call or in a, in a, in a no, like, not only in, in an in-person environment, could they start forming relationships through this or does it have to be coupled in, in, based on your, your belief with a, a face-to-face encounter that is going to create a base and then, yeah. and then this will be a, an extra interaction? It's not impossible to form relations. Of course, at, at one level, you know, you can introduce somebody new to the to the to the group at work. You know, this is our new uh, whatever. Um, uh, meet everybody else, and they all go hi. Uh, you know, yeah. um, but it's still not the same because the little pictures on the screen, uh, you know, they're little pictures. Um, they're not like a whole person standing in front of you. So somehow it makes it much more difficult. To establish a relationship yes they can learn something a little bit about you but they don't kind of get the feel it's very hard to kind of describe this because it is what psychologists will call and philosophers would call raw feels this is you know this is the kind of emotional sense we have on the right hand side of the brain which we find very difficult to put into words because words are dealt with on the left hand side of the brain um, they're the conscious bits, and but we know what we mean. You know, we we know when we get on with somebody because somehow we feel we feel it in yeah. our bones. You know, um, uh, and and that seems to be possible only by being there in person. So I think the problem um, that <clears throat> is emerges in the context of say hybrid working is how you combine the. Of course, you know. Hybrid working is great, um, you know, and academics like me have done hybrid working for a very long time, many, many decades, uh, and it's very effective. But at the end of the day, we have to remember two things. You know, one is there are a bunch of people in the, in, in the business who can't do it, right? There's no way they can do it. They stand at the door, the security, uh, they sit at the desk at reception, uh, you know, they sweep the floors, yep. they make the sandwiches in the cafe, all these people, they're all poorly paid and they can only do their job there. Nurses in the hospital, you know, the doctors can go home and think about, yep. you know, new medicines. The nurses have to be there <laughs> every day, yep. you know, 24 hours a day. Um, so we have to be careful not to create a two class society. You know, people who can work hybrid and are paid a lot of money and people who can't work hybrid and are poor. And that because that creates re resentment right? straight away. That's destroying what you're trying to create, this sense yes. of belonging to a village in your business. So um, aside, you know, aside from that, you know, it, it's an issue of how you create opportunities that allow new workers coming in to meet everybody in a social environment. And, and I think that needs to be thought through very carefully. Too often we kind of think, well, you know, okay, you can work at home two days a week, that's fine. Just come on days when you have meetings. But actually the meetings you have are probably much less important for the efficiency of the business than the casual conversations you have in the yes. cafe at lunchtime or while you're getting a cup of coffee from the coffee machine, these kind of things. Or the opportunity you have to talk to somebody who you just met in a meeting while you're walking back to your office, you know, somebody new and, and you're building, build, building that relationship. And there's some very nice research uh, uh, that was carried out by Microsoft on all their employees in the US, because uh, they could do this during lockdown and they looked at the email traffic people have and, uh, and the online traffic they have um, through, through you know, sort of um, uh, virtual conferencing facilities like Zoom and so on. And what they showed is, yes, email traffic with your little work group continued, right? Even when you're working at home. What dropped out completely, just almost disappeared by comparison anyway, 
is email exchanges with casual people that you met in a uh, committee face to face you would go oh you know okay i have a you know some you know, basis for a relationship with you we need to pursue this and then you when you get back to your desk you send them emails afterwards when that's happening virtually and your committee is is on zoom you that doesn't happen so that follow-on development that's very interesting. doesn't happen on top of that it turned out that everybody was spending much more time in zoom meetings than they had been in face-to-face -face meetings so actually their time was being used incredibly inefficiently at home because they felt i guess I, i'm kind of guessing here that probably what happens you know at, at work somebody says there's a meeting and you go yeah maybe i should be there but I, i'm busy <laughs> at home you think oh it's a meeting on zoom i'd better be there <laughs> let, let <me. laughs> so you go to every meeting <laughs> and that's yeah, usually yeah. a waste of time uh, even that that's a waste of time even at work in face-to-face -face meetings usually but it you don't that's want to be left out so you know th the whole system really is not kind of designed for our, our psychology terribly well at least not yet it might improve with with experience and practice but i think it comes back to the fact that you know in the end you need to think very carefully about providing opportunities where people can meet uh, even if they're yes. working at home <clears throat> a lot of the time and there was a very nice example of this actually which and this kind of highlights this whole problem uh, um, uh, I remember a talk given by by uh, two very senior guys at one of the big multinationals, and they had amalgamated their um, uh, headquarters campuses because they had several uh, uh, scattered over quite a big area. And they thought it's just as crazy because people are spending time driving between the campuses. We'll make one new campus, put everybody on there. We'll make beautiful facilities, nice restaurants gyms to go and exercise in boutique shops everybody will have a laptop to work at home and we'll do hot testing and they spend a lot of time talking everybody through because they thought the people who would object to this would be all the senior people who would older people who would say oh you know where's my big thick carpeted office and you know with nice furniture and three secretaries and all this kind of thing <laughs> um and what do you mean sit with everybody else <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and the people, the younger people, they thought they would just love it, and it turned out to be completely wrong. The old people said, "Whoopee, uh, <laughs> just I'm going tomorrow. <laughs> I can have a game of golf at lunchtime. I can take the kids to school. All these kind of things. And I'll come in when I need to." All the young people, they said, it, it absolutely shocked them because they had not un expected this. They said, "All the young people said, what do you mean work at home? I come in to work." to see my friends that yes. is my social world and it's back to this yes. thing that with so much movement around uh, not just between countries but even within a country um, the only place you're going to be able to meet people as somebody new starting in a new city is the people at work so naturally they become your first choice for making you, friendships your social circle until you've until you've had a chance to, to establish a home life somewhere and that can take several years usually you know but for, yeah. for, for getting you involved into the the local community in some sense the friends you make at work are, are, are hugely important and if you forget that if we forget that you know business is going to be in trouble